In this beautiful sea of new and used vehicles, it's often very difficult to understand as a consumer which vehicles will actually last a very, very long time and which ones won't even make it 10 years. And guess what? It's not just about the way you take care of it. There are actually some predetermined conditions actually lead to whether that vehicle is going to last a long, long time or not. It's often like our health. Some people just have certain genetics for long life and other people have genetics that means they're going to struggle with health issues through and through their entire lifespan. But this is an engineering project, so this is actually a little easier to control than your health. However, I'm gonna help you guys shuffle through the smoke and mirrors and I'm gonna share four key reasons how some vehicles live a long, long time and others will be in their crusher before 10 years. Let's get into it now. Life's too short to drive boring cars. So the first piece that actually can determine the lifespan of a particular vehicle is what's buried under the hood and it's called the engine. Now what we're looking at here is the four liter V6 engine, makes about 270 horsepower in this Toyota 4Runner and they're bulletproof. Yes, they're not the most efficient, they use a lot of fuel, they're thirsty, but they have a solid torque band and they will literally run for hundreds of thousands of miles as long as you keep the relatively fresh oil inside those cars. I attribute this to a vehicle like George Burns. Sits around, doesn't overstrain himself, but lives to 105 years old. But you don't see them running a marathon or anything, as opposed to a car like this. We have the Porsche 911 GT3, brand new, fresh off the boat, absolutely spectacular car. But what this provides is a drivetrain or an engine, if you will, that is more like an Olympic athlete or an Olympic sprinter. Yes, this can go from zero to hero in no time flat. And where the Toyota runs reliably for hundreds of thousands of miles, this one can run reliably when you run it flat out. Try driving the Toyota on a racetrack like you put this thing through the severe duty. It won't survive. They all have their applications. However, engines like you find in the 911 GT3 are built to severe duty. In other words, they're a race engine and they will last the test of time. But then on the other side of the scale, you have engines that don't last worth a hoot. For example, like this, we have a BMW X3 says 28i on it. In other words, this has the N20 turbocharged four-cylinder two-liter engine. Now, it's not so much that the four-cylinder engine has to be that bad. It's just that, unfortunately, we're talking about an engine that hasn't been engineered well enough to hold up. You get timing chain failures, oil leaks from the bottom, from the top, oil pan gaskets, oil filter housing leaks, coolant leaks from water pumps, thermostats, as well as all of the snap-together hoses, translates to engineered obsolescence built into these BMWs. All right, here we have the Kia Optima. Absolutely hits all of the radars in terms of recalls. Not a well-designed vehicle by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, Kia and Hyundai have been getting better in the last few years. However, NHTSA and the recall list have been filled with vehicles that say Kia on the front end of it. But what's the problem? It's the engines in here. That's right, they actually have a fault within the manufacturing process, means they've got some metal filings in the oiling, cooling passages, results in excessive heating at the rod bearings and other parts, and ultimately results in either a catastrophic engine failure or even worse, a fire on the roadside. Yes, that's been a very common topic with these particular engines. Some engines, no matter what you do, they'll just last hundreds of thousands of miles. For example, Toyota Camrys and Corollas, 4Runners, they'll go forever. Most Hondas, with the exception of possibly the new 1.5 liter turbo, will typically run as well a long, long time. So having a good engine can literally make or break the lifespan of that vehicle. We also can't forget the simple fact that if you're dealing with some of the Japanese vehicles like in a Toyota, that you're often going to find cheap repairs. So some of the vehicles, even if they do break, you don't mind putting a little money into them. However, if you blow up an engine in something like this, you'd be more inclined just to move it down the road. The second factor which can determine the lifespan of a vehicle is the transmission. And for example, in the latest and greatest Subaru WRX, you can actually expect to get a CVT. That's the continuously variable transmission and they're known to fail. They're not much more or less than an all-terrain vehicle with a bunch of pulleys and belts, and they don't last all that well. They're known to be quite unreliable, and when they fail, we're talking about thousands of dollars. And the maintenance of them, too, is a little more than you would expect from a standard torque converter type transmission. And then Ford has their share, too, with the power shift transmission in the Ford Focus or the Fiestas of certain generations. Yes, there's been lawsuits, there's been lots of people complaining, and quite frankly, enough is enough. If you're going to want to buy one of these cars, these power price point cars, definitely get the manual transmission that's going to save you a lot of heartburn. So the general consensus is most vehicles that have the CVT transmission just don't last all that long. 
Torque converter transmissions, for example, the ZF 8-speed automatic, can actually be known for relative durability and their driving pleasure. They're actually a relatively solid transmission. And yet there's other torque converter style transmissions that are just junk. For example, I knew somebody that had a Plymouth Grand Voyager and the transmission blew apart. It literally blew a hole in the floor and all the oil and bits and pieces came out. And we were told later that there's a pin within the transmission that starts to back out. And as it's turning, it starts to eat away at the housing and then blows apart completely. Poorly built transmission. And then if you go with the brown like Porsche here, you can either get the manual transmission, which is literally the lowest maintenance and the easiest for service and longevity, or you can get the PDK, which is their double clutch transmission, just like you're finding in Ferraris, McLarens. Some of the higher end performance or exotics often go with the double clutch transmission, which can be a little more costly to maintain. And it's certainly heavier than a torque converter transmission, although it is lightning fast in terms of shift speed. So you're trading reliability for performance. So with a manual transmission, the worst you have to do is a clutch. With a car like a 911, you might have to pull the transmission and engine out. It might cost you $5,000 to do an all-in service, but that's a premium car. You go with the older Tiptronics, they're more torque converter style, very simple and reliable. Or if you go with this particular car, then you actually can get the double clutch transmission. All great options, but we're talking about a $15,000 to $20,000 repair versus 5K for a manual transmission clutch job or six or seven for a rebuilt Tiptronic. So could you imagine if you had to put a $4,000 transmission in this Dodge Caravan and it's only worth six grand on the used retail market if it's got good miles, that truly would be a stinger and would be enough to motivate a person to kick it to the dumpster. And the next factoid is actually has to do with technology. And that's right, some of the modern day vehicles have way too much technology. For example, Tesla, all the electronics, they have modules on modules, for example, BMWs also have a lot of problems like that. When modules start to fail, it gets very expensive. But what we have here is a Range Rover. This vehicle was literally easily deep into the six figures when it was brand new. But look at it now. It's a sorry, sad state of affairs. Parked here in the back 40, nobody wants it. It's left here to die because there's so much technology. Do you know these Range Rovers are literally some of the best vehicles off-roading? Well, there's a lot of technology, both mechanical technology as well as electronic technology to allow this vehicle to dig its way out of the route. But there's other things. Look right there. This vehicle's sitting on its haunches right now. Why? Because it's got an air ride suspension. So after with time, that system starts to leak and now it's sitting on its rump. That can cost thousands to fix. Then right here, little windshield wipers. How cute is that on the headlights? Well, do you really need that? I mean, really? Not as far as I can say, but you put all these little extras on there and that's just one more item to fail. And let's face it, a lot of the British cars have struggled with electrical issues. Throw more electrical features at these vehicles, what do you think's gonna happen? Inside we have adjustable armrests. And lo and behold, look, there's a fuse box and it's open because they're troubleshooting another electrical problem. So the problem is a lot of these premium brands, for example, BMW, $185 an hour, these guys here closer to that same price tag, you get into the exotics, it's even worse yet. When you start to see electrical faults, that takes more labor to dig in and start troubleshooting. That labor costs money. Can you think about $200 every hour on the hour that it takes for a troubleshooting tech to get to the bottom of an issue? That's why it's easy to bankrupt these vehicles in short order, just because of all the technology buried under the skin of these fine vehicles. So the fourth item has to do with car brands that are trying to dazzle you with their nonsense. Newer innovative technologies, higher level of performance, newer methods of construction, and the support of new construction type materials. For example, the aggressive use and adoption of plastics under the hood of a lot of new luxury vehicles. Are other reasons why you can quickly make a very expensive vehicle worth nothing. So all companies like Audi are using plastic oil pans, plastic intake manifolds that are all combined with other components that make it very difficult and expensive to replace. While cars like BMW, for example, are using electric water pumps that are known to fail under the heat and the excruciating volume of coolant that flows through them, as well as plastic intake manifolds and plastic valve covers. And those plastic hoses with the snap ends that literally will break away after 70 or 80,000 miles because of all the heating cooling cycles, but it makes it quicker and easier in the factory, not in a service shop. Car makers like Toyota instead are using hoses that are actual rubber hoses butt up right up to the fitting and then used a constant tension spring that doesn't let go. Many of the water pumps are still mechanical by nature and up until the most recent Toyota Tundra change, they've typically been mostly naturally aspirated in the Toyota world for the sake of reliability over performance. 
So while some brands are really reaching out for the innovation, they're worried a lot less about the reliability and the quality control even behind that. What they are worried about is the bottom dollar and getting customers in and out on leases every three years so they can keep that flow. And then for those four or five year old vehicles, they get injected back into the service department and that cycle goes round and around, keeping that model very much alive. The use of plastics, yes, you betcha. BMW is investing in a 3D printing facility and they plan fully to use a lot more plastic in years to come. Where's a lot of Hondas, Toyotas, Acuras, Lexus, they focus a lot more in pride of construction, pride of engineering and design, a lot more in quality control. And if there's problems along the way, they try to fix it in the middle of a production run so that they don't have that carry through and, and impact tens of thousands of vehicles. Now with all of that said, I hope I really helped you with that. Right there, you're gonna also check that video. It's really going to share some great examples of five vehicles that won't even make it 10 years. Hope to see you each and every one of you on the next one. Catch you real soon. Bye-bye.